The last 24 hours have been scary and exceptional all at the same time. I'm talking about the attack from Iran on Israel as a revenge attack for Israel attacking Iran's base. To help me understand everything going on in this fast-paced topic, I have with me Colonel Tony Schaefer. Colonel Schaefer, thank you for joining me today. Stephen, always a pleasure to join you. I look forward to the conversation. So uh, I want to read a quote from General Wesley Clark about Iran and Israel and then get your thoughts on it. He sure. said, Israel is not going to trust the United States if Iran strikes. Right. Now they have. It can't because look at what's happening in Gaza right now with the pressure between the United States and Israel. Iran has to feel like they're kind of winning right now. They've got the United States and Israel at odds. Hamas has survived. You've got the whole world down on Israel for what's gone on in Gaza. This was part of the plan. So there's a lot to unpack there. First, is this part of a greater plan to create a regional war in the Middle East again? So the answer is, I think a number of groups, both Tehran hardliners, as well as um, uh, individuals, who uh, on our our side want to get us into the war into a war with uh, with uh, Tehran? They'd love to have have the conflict. I mean, the neocons want it, the hardliners in Tehran want it. So it's more about who doesn't want it. <laughs> Even I mean, there's a lot of folks who who really want to see this happen, and um, I'm not one of them. I don't think you are. I think most of your, your audience recognizes there's no good to come from any conflict, especially there. So I think he's correct in that there are those seeking to expand the conflict. And uh, one of those groups, believe it or not, I'm just going to say it is Biden. I think Biden, if it wasn't for an election year, uh, he is a neocon. I think uh, Blinken's a neocon. I, Austin, I think, is a political uh, kind of ambivalent to whoever he can work for and have power. So I don't think necessarily Austin's a neocon. He's just not competent. But that's a different story. So I think if it wasn't for November and Trump being anti-war and people looking at his successful four years of no, no, no more war, I think Biden and company would be all in letting the uh, letting the dogs of war go loose on on on, on both sides at this point. OK, uh, I mean, General Clark kind of alluded to the fact that Israel is losing the PR war uh, and that this is all by design. Hamas has essentially walked them yeah. into a trap to kill innocent people. They've walked into it, killed tens of thousands. Uh, and now are, are they, is Hamas trying to get Turkey and Iran and other Arab nations to join in on the attack of Israel? No, I think at this point they recognize, like we saw a, I, I call it a coalition of the willing, much like uh, Desert One, Desert, St Desert Storm, when we moved into Desert Storm. Uh, you had the Jordanians, Egyptians, uh, Saudis quietly, they were all helping uh, fend off the uh, the, uh, the uh, Iranian attack. Um, and here's why. There's still the Sunni-Shia split, Stephen. Uh, people tend to overlook the fact that, yeah, as much as Iran hates the Jews and, and, and uh, Israel, they hate the, the Sunni as much. And as a matter of fact, and I think some, some ways more vigorously. So always remember, and I know it's difficult because sometimes people... It's all, you know, it's all the Middle East. It's not. There's a lot of subtle subtleties that I think people don't recognize. So first off, the Iranians are not Arabs. They're Persians. They're Persian they're, they, as a tradition, as a culture, are much more European than they are Middle Eastern. Just saying. I mean, that's why right now there's an opportunity to get, have the green movement and the, the youth in, in Tehran rise up against their government. They don't like their government. They don't like having the mullahs and this extremist Muslim Islamic uh, uh, Sharia law placed upon them. So there's a huge opportunity there. And that's why the mullahs are always trying to figure out a way to do it. And so this is how why I caution on any strong military strike back against Iran by anybody, don't alienate the people. The people of, of, of Iran are not the enemy. The people of Iran, I think, are as much prisoners of, of circumstance as were, were, this, were the Russian people under, under Joe Stalin and the Soviets. So you have to look at that and examine that. And I've, I've uh, Professor Alan Dershowitz said on Newsmax the other day, we need to just go to war. It's like, yeah, no, it's not that easy. We don't want to go and create conditions where 
Iran as a country, not just the mullahs, not just the IRGC and the leadership want to come and kill us. The whole country does. Right now, it's not that not that way. So always remember Persians versus Arabs, and then also uh, Shia versus Sunni. The Sunni are a group of the Arabs. They're mostly Arabs. They're they're the the, the folks in uh, in uh, Qatar, in Bahrain, in uh, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt. So you always have that split in Iran and in, in, in Islam, which goes back to the beginning of the thing. And you're not going to change that the trajectory of that of that disagreement. Uh, they need a, they, you know, we had a reformation in in, in the in the in the cath in the um, in the Christian faith. You know, Catholics, Protestants, that you have that split in Islam, and that's not going to. We're not going to resolve. They they have to resolve that. Uh, and so, but that's always underlying why the Iranians, the the Shia, don't like the the Arab, the the Saudi Arabians, the Sunni. That's the fundamental uh, basis for this potential nuclear arms race. So I'm going, this is a long way of answering your question, but I needed to give it context because now you bring in the Israelis. The Israelis, for better or for worse, through the Abraham Accords and other efforts, I've, I've been over and met with both groups uh, during the Trump years, are, 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 have come up with an, a, a potential concept to resolve the differences between the Israelis, the, the, the Jews, and the Sunni, the, the Arabs. Abraham Accords, like, hey, why can't we all just get along? So that is still in motion, and I think that's why you saw Egypt, uh, Jordan, Jordan vigorously, uh, the British, because the British are always there with us doing things, you know, and then the Saudis all sided with with uh, with Israel. So I just don't see any ganging up. The only people that did the attack were the Iranians, were the um, the. Uh, Houthi, Houthi fired a few missiles, uh, Hezbollah, and of course, I, I think you probably had a few things going on internally that I were reported, but that was who was atta attacking the Arabs sided with the Israelis for better or for worse. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so just just minutes before you and I got on, I'm reading that Biden has called for a meeting with the G7 leaders. However, the head of the United Nations is demanding an immediate ceasefire in Gaza and telling the United States, bow out, do not help Israel, do not retaliate against Iran. Do you yeah. think the United uh, Nations has any kind of pull when it comes to uh, military action with the United States? No, I don't. I, and this is the goes to your question. You answered your own questions. Like the, the massive amount of global information operations against Israel, is, is this is another one. It's like the UN demanding that they stop. Um, let me be clear on my position so your audience doesn't, doesn't think I'm taking things out or I'm saying something that they don't understand. I believe that the Israelis have every right to respond to the events of 7 October. That includes going after the Iranians, who has been reported by multiple credible outlets. The Iranians had funded Hamas to the tune of 200 million euro over the time leading up to the attack. So as far as I'm concerned, that's a provable fact. Therefore, the, the Iranians were uh, a, a, a causal uh, factor and partner with Hamas to attack. So I think the Israelis have every right to go back. They have lost that bubble. That, that is, the Israelis have lost the bubble of saying, no, 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 we have the right to respond. And this is a response. Because the Iranians then invoked UN uh, regulations over, on Saturday saying, oh, no, 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 we're just doing this in response to the attack of 1 April. It's like, no, no, no. I, and this is where if I were them, I would have said, no, 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 no. Sorry. This goes back to 7 October and make that that logic link, link it back to why they're doing it, why they attacked these guys who, by the way, the, Irani the Iranians who were killed were not in a consulate or on embassy property. They were in a, in a, in a, a facility at, at what we would call a safe site or safe house next to uh, sovereign Iranian land, but they weren't on it. So this this is another lost battle. They lost that war. Everybody says, "Oh, they the Jewish folks hit the Iranian." They did. They they didn't. This wasn't an expansion. They were very precise about that. But to your point, they're not doing. They the Iranian the Israelis are not doing a good job in the information operations of pushing back, saying, "No, no, no, this is nonsense." But I, what I'm saying to you is, at this point, because they they are being overwhelmed, they the Israelis being overwhelmed by this massive false and and I'll just say it's not misinformation it's it's false information it's just you can prove it's provably false 
and yet it's still being carried by mainstream outlets. And and the, but again, this is a long way of getting to the answer to the question. No, the UN has no pull. Nobody cares. Now, I I say nobody cares any more than Joe Biden uh, about what Joe Biden says. You know, when when Joe Biden says don't don't don't, they do do do. See, that's a that's a new police song, right? They could probably fit into a tomb. So. Um, so speaking of Biden, um, yeah. why, why is he having such a hard time deciding whom to support? Um, it, it's starting to feel a little schizophrenic on the one hand, he says, um, uh, you know, we support Israel, but then he's funding both sides of the war. Right. He's also saying the United States, it's a, it's an ironclad support of Israel, but then Israel's attacked and they say, we won't support you in retaliating against Iran. It, it's a little bit confusing for those of us not uh, accustomed to Washington, D.C. rhetoric. You said it yourself. They're playing both sides against the middle. Oh, yeah, yeah. We, we, we support the uh, Israelis. We're going to help you stop these uh, things. Oh, but we're only going to help you stop it to a certain level. We're not going to let you go and get the core to the core of the issue, Stephen. This is, it's like, it's there. And, and the reason is domestic politics who's in charge a, a guy who i think looks like and i'm going to be a little bit of a wise ass here you, you remember the remember the, the tv series the muppets yes so uh, jake sullivan looks like beaker from the muppets as far as i'm concerned kind of that, oh. <laughs> that look and, and 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 he yeah and so when he goes out about a week before the 7 october attack and says oh the Middle East is as quiet as it's been in, in, in years. It's a flat-out provable lie. It wasn't even true when he said it. It was certainly not true, true on the 7th of October. It's even less true now. And yet somehow John Kirby comes out, who works for, you know, works for people to remember. It's like John, John Kirby works directly for Jake Sullivan. Now. So whatever John says is what Jake tells him to say. Uh, and he's asked several times over the weekend, John Kirby on the Sunday shows yesterday, on Sunday, says, um, uh, was is, is the use of weapons coming directly from Iran, hitting uh, uh, Israel, and an escalation of the war. Well, uh, my answer is uh, the Israelis were really good. That's not the question. The question is, was this an expansion? Of course, the answer is yes, it was very much. Uh, and I could go into why it is in a number of, a long answer, but I'll, I'll save you from that for now, unless you want to ask that question. The bottom line is they live in an alternate reality. Uh, Jake Sullivan is a is a um, is a politician first, trying to get Joe Biden reelected, a uh, official of the Democrat Party second, and probably a national security expert somewhere near thirteenth or fourteenth in line of his duties. This is not about national security; it's about getting Joe Biden reelected. And so everything you see that they do and say has to do with the the continuance of power, no matter what it takes, and lying and and deceiving to the point of. Of it, as, as much as they can get away with, sometimes they don't even get away with it. They get caught and they lie anyway. And that's what's going on. So that's why you see this, what I've called wackadoodle national security policy, where we literally are funding both sides because the idea is not to, it's not to win, it's not to lose. They're, they're trying not to lose. And anytime you try not to lose, ultimately you always fail across the board. Okay. I, I think one thing my uh, viewers would want to know, because I want to know is, uh, is this going to further escalate the Middle East war or is this Iran um, ha having to display a show of force in order to maintain rapport with their people? Uh, I don't know if that question makes sense. It does. Okay. And yes, it does. A certain amount of this was to save face. That is to say, we had to do something. That's why it was delayed a week. There's a, 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 a Financial Times article that came out on the 12th, the day before, which basically said the Iranians have been negotiating about what kind of response to, to send. And they've been telling the United States, kind of, there's been, there's been pre court it looks like there's been pre-coordination. Nobody has a smoking gun, but it's kind of like, hey, there was a week between the time of when they said they were going to attack and when they attacked. There's indicators that they were going to third parties, reaching out to the United States. So... I think there was a lot of that going on where, you know, Iran had to do something. By the way, we did, Trump did the same thing. When Sole, when he when he whacked Soleimani, Soleimani, there was some level of, yeah, you can go whack a couple of bases in Iraq, but don't kill anybody. And they did. I mean, my, apparently Mike Pompeo coordinated that. So I think there was some level. But think about this, Stephen. 
that was the most expensive display of fireworks in the history of mankind. There was upwards of a billion dollars with a B of, of hardware, software, missiles fired by the Israelis to defend themselves against about probably between 600 to 800 million dollars of hardware, software, and missiles shot by the Iranians. Think about that. Now, no nation on earth can sustain that level of, of continued use of weapons. So while it's all well and good, this was a massive display of technology as well. And I think there's a far more, there was far more going on that people recognized regarding who was trying to get through to what. And, and some, you know, about 1% did get through, didn't hit anything important. That is from Iran to the Israelis. But um, you tell me, a billion dollars seems like a lot of money to spend. And I don't think the Israelis could continue to do that. So I think part of this was the, the Iranians getting a legitimate test in. It's like, how much do we have to have to overwhelm the, Iran, the Israeli defenses. And oh, by the way, if you start mixing in nuclear weapons in that thing, man, it, it, Katie barred the door. So this is far from over. I think this was a test by both sides. I think this was a legitimate military exchange of technology, you know, as in like conflict, like exchanging blows to see what worked and didn't. And um, I think both sides learned a lot. But I'll say this, uh, the Joe Biden administration is simply a, a tourist in its own foreign policy at this point. I think they've lost the bubble. Uh, at this point, this is, we're in, 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 today in the Biden administration, we're in that last minute before the Titanic hits the iceberg, metaphorically, just saying. And because it is the anniversary of the Titanic striking, just saying, but I yeah. think the metaphor still fits. Yeah. Um, question for you. Uh, Vladimir Putin of Russia has immediately come out saying, uh, warning the United States, do not intervene. Let Israel and Iran work this out. Everybody should be seeking for peace. And if you're not going to seek for peace, then we will side with Iran and we will come after you. Is he telling the truth? Is this uh, a dog barking? What What are your thoughts on Vladimir? He's already sided with Iran. It's, 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 it's like they're already using, Stephen, Iranian-made drones against the Ukrainians. It's already done. And oh, by the way, one of the weapons I, I, I'm hitting at that may have been tested was a hypersonic, a, an Iranian-made hypersonic missile that may have been fired during these uh, these uh, the exchange on Saturday. And the Iranians don't have that kind of technology. To have a hypersonic missile requires a very sophisticated understanding of, of advanced materials, uh, like metals and things like that, a great deal of information regarding uh, crunching, uh, the, the numbers regarding uh, avionics and atmospherics. It's a very sophisticated thing. And then if, if they did test one, which I'm not saying they did, I don't know, I, I think the jury's still out, they had to get that from someone, and that someone probably was the Russians, you know, because they are cooperating. So I'm saying there's a lot more going on than meets the eye here, and so I I don't just I I know I know what Putin's saying. I think he needs to be the one staying out of it because they have no traditional relationship between Israel and the United States in this area. But I think he sees benefit. Remember, the more Biden blunders, the more Putin benefits. Putin's benefiting rather than whether if we like it or not. Yeah, well, the, I mean, what's interesting is you have Iran, which, you know, they're wearing their hats, make Iran great again. Russia's yep. wearing make Russia great again. Yep. China's making make Russia or make China great again. These three countries are all very focused on building the next generation uh, and, and dominating. And yet they're all coordinating together to undermine right. the United States and allies. So when Putin says we're going to back Iran, I, I do believe him. Um, whether, you know, that hypersonic technology, Russia definitely has it. If they didn't use it this time, it could definitely be used in the next one. Because as you said, Russia has already taken in these, these Iranian uh, drones and successfully used them against Zelensky and Ukraine. Why wouldn't yeah. they do a weapon swap uh, and, and come after Israel with, with bigger, uh, more powerful weaponry? Um I, yeah, I Stephen, would, I, this is a chess game. This is a chess game. To your point, you're you're kind of laying out the potential chess pieces, and we got a guy playing checkers in a, in a form of Joe Biden. Just saying. So. Yeah. Well, I, I'm I'm reading that uh, Biden and and the Pentagon have held private meetings that the United States could potentially be being tricked into a war. Even with knowing that, do you think they'll fall into the trap, or do you think that they're intelligent enough to avoid it? They, 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 they're powerless. It, it doesn't matter. Remember back in the last, uh, if you remember, this is before you and I started talking or you had your audience. 
back during the Obama days, at the very end of the Obama administration, Syria was really heating up. And uh, do you know which major country was absent from being part of the negotiations to end the hostilities in Syria in the last year of the Obama administration? United States. Mm -hmm. The United States was excluded because they saw Obama like they, we, they, they now saw by it's like they don't they, they don't want they don't care. I, I'll say it again for the record. Joe Biden is now a tourist in his own foreign policy. They have no idea how to get out of this. They created the conditions, no doubt. They gave the Iranians a massive amount of money, plus a sanction relief. Plus, uh, they didn't they didn't actually do anything when the uh, there was a ban on uh, Tehran developing ballistic missile boosters because that's what you needed to launch nuclear weapons. You need a booster. Uh, they let that expire without any any protestation. Uh, they can go back and start doing research now. So my point is, the more uh, the more chaos comes from this the less the Biden administration has to, to to influence it. And I think at this point, again, it's it's like the Titanic, that last minute before it hits the iceberg. There's just not, you know, they're going to be doing all these things, trying to reverse motors and turn things. It's whatever's going to happen is going to happen without the Biden administration having any influence. Yeah. So sun, Sunday morning, I saw two main things happening over on Twitter. Um, the first was... Uh, Americans pointing out that the U.S. military shot down about 70 percent of the drones and, and missiles and, and how, how well they were able to help Israel. But the one that shocked me was how many people on Twitter were saying, this is your fault, Joe. Yeah. Uh, all of the money you released, the the uh, break, you know, breaking open this opportunity for China to send hundreds of billions of dollars in oil purchases. Uh, I, I was a little bit caught off guard by how many people are actually blaming Joe Biden for the rise of Iran. I, I think it's uh, it's it's you can't put a happy face on it. You can't hide it. Even the AP, the AP, which is not a, a big uh, supporter of anybody except who's in power, has actually said, you know, interviewed people and said, the Biden Biden folks said, well, we had no idea that they'd use the money for this. Of course they did. Of course they did. This is like. Putting a chef in the kitchen and saying, you know, with a full with a bunch of raw ingredients, he's going to cook. If you put a tennis guy on a tennis court with a with a racket and ball, he's going to play tennis. I mean, come on. You give billions of dollars to a terror a nation that uses terror and violence as a method of, of inflicting its its religious based foreign policy. It's going to use violence. I mean, this was predictable. It, 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 it this this is the ultimate expression of 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 um, peak by the Biden administration to somehow you know, pretend they, did, they didn't know this would happen. They knew it would happen. And instead of understanding the outcome, they, they, they somehow, you have academics like Tony Blinken who literally act based on aspirations. They are unwilling or unable to internalize facts as they are, not as, as aspirations they want them to be. And they always act on aspirations and feelings, not on facts and reality. That's why you see the chaos that's why you see that level of incompetence. It's not incompetence, it's arrogance. And that's what's going on. Okay. Uh, final question. I appreciate you taking time out of sure. your day to, to be with me. What What is Israel's next move? That Are they going to retaliate? Is the United States going to jump in on it, even though publicly they've said, uh, we don't want to get involved. We want cooler heads to prevail. What What is Israel's next move? Netanyahu will retaliate. I think, uh, speaking of cooler heads, they, they're taking a step back. I think they were shocked, as many of us were, that the United States said, oh, we're going to help help you absorb the attack and, and you know, parry the attack from Iran. But but don't don't respond. It's like, that's we wouldn't do that. If, if uh, you know, let me give you a hypothetical. If, if Cuba started firing uh, nuclear missiles at us, I think we'd do something. Didn't, oh, yeah, 1962, that almost happened. And we almost wiped Cuba off the map. So yeah, I don't, I don't think we'd be standing that for Stephen. I just, I just don't think it would happen. So the idea now that the Biden administration is like, no, Netanyahu will be, he'll be polite, but he's got two things he has, or three things he has to do. He has to finish uh, Hezbollah in, uh, I mean, he's got to finish Hamas in in Rafa. They've got to do that. They will. They've got to consider Hezbollah and what Hezbollah is going to do in the north. They did fire some rockets in, in during this. And obviously, that would be a, a logical expansion of the conflict to go take care of them. And third, 
continue to, I, I think, degrade, because we're not going to do it, I think they're going to degrade Tehran's ability to use the IRGC and Quds Force to facilitate operations against the Israelis. And, and so that means going after leadership. And uh, I, I, for one, recommend do more one April attacks because uh, the, the Iranians are not going to back down. You've given them all this money. You've got to go and do things. And let me make a comment about why. I'm, I'm going to ask her, ask her, answer a question you didn't ask. Okay. I'm, I'm, you're like it. So why did Trump, why was Trump's foreign policy so different? Two reasons. First, we see right now this, this pyramid of action. So at the top is, is Tehran and the IRGC, and they have all these, these uh, proxies which do things down below. So the Biden administration's going through and fighting the Houthi and doing this, and they're fighting all these low-level, like symptoms of the disease, not going after the disease. Trump's not going to do that. He's going to go after the guy at the top. It's like Soleimani. It's like, hey, you're the knucklehead coordinating all this. Let's either make a deal or you're dead. It is what it is. I'm just being direct. So, you know, let's not, let's not try to fight the pyramid. Let's get the guy at the top and then cut the head off and be done with it. So that's number one. That's why the Trump foreign policy was so different. He didn't mess around. He went for what we call the centers of gravity. Secondly, the chaos. One of the things notable in this is that you have the momentum of the bureaucracy, which exists, the, the permanent bureaucracy, the people that impeached Trump first time, Vindman and, and all these other knuckleheads who went after him. And the reason they went after him, Stephen, is because he, Trump, dared go against the professional bureaucracy, which knows better than him. Oh, we're even. And so this bureaucracy continues to march forward like we're seeing now with policies, whether they work or not, because they're smarter than us. We're, we're the, the, the guys who have gone and got all the degrees. So, you know, we're telling you, you need to continue to do this. And so that's why you have the Blinkens and Sullivan's, all these other folks doing things that, that result in catastrophic failure. But they don't care. They're, they're going to continue the policies. Trump. Trump didn't stand for that. If Trump saw something that wasn't working, it's like, yeah, we're not going to do that. And of course, the internal bureaucracy went nuts. What do you mean? It's like Vindman said, you know, on, on during impeachment, he was destroying our foreign policy. No, no, no. He was departing from policy that wasn't working and you didn't like it. That's what the deal was. So I'm just saying that's what is distinguishing. And that's why what we see now did not is causing chaos. And what Trump did did not cause chaos because he recognized chaos is a bad thing. His chaos was only against the internal bureaucracy. It was it was actually to resolve and end the chaos at the international level. And that's why we see what we're seeing right now with such contrast. Okay. Wow. Colonel Tony Schaefer, thank you so much 